Today, she will be talking about the Eckblatt Report, The Time for Equality, an important publication which sets out an intellectual and political challenge to the Latin American region, as well as to the global community at large. After her presentation, uh, we will have comments by two very distinguished e uh, economists, uh, Professor Giovanni Andrea Cardia from the University of Florence, uh, and also and Martin Sambu, a member of the editorial uh, board of the Financial Times. And then, after they speak, we will have time for questions from the audience. So, without more, to see you. long-term vision, but to have a long-term vision, we have to start where we are now. So where are we now? But the political leaders of the region are taking up development in their hands. And this was not happening before. To tell you the truth, many of the economics of our region were handled, not because we don't like them, but the finance ministers were the ones who were charting the course of development, or not development, whatever, or growth, or whatever. But now that the heads of state themselves are really uh, you know, so politics is back. Now, our region was better prepared than in previous crises. Of course, we were better, better prepared. Less integrated, though. Why were we better prepared? Number one, because in this period uh, between 2002 and 2008, basically 2003 and 2008, the region was able to reduce in a very important way the um, public debt. Now, in the crisis, we thought that uh, unemployment was going to grow even higher, and we were going to get up in 2009 to levels of 9%. However, due to the programs applied by countries, particularly the southern home countries applied very active policies on employment, unemployment in 2009 is going to close near to 8.3%, but still is high for our region. Besides the improvement in poverty rates, there were also, for the first time ever, ever in the history of Latin America, we have been impro seen improvements in income distribution. That is, one of the elements of growth is equality. Just like Brazil did it. Brazil gave the poor households capacity purchasing power through redistributive uh, transfers, and that's the way that economy really is recuperated. During 2009, our countries were in the middle of the crisis, but they had space to apply some public policies that were so important. For example, monetary and financial policies, fiscal policies that were counter-cyclical, trade policies, and labor policies. One sign of alarm, I want to say, in terms of the trade that we are having in Latin America is that the exports of Latin America are basically from the primary sector. We think that the region is facing at least six very important gaps. And that's why our document is called Closing Gaps and Opening Trade, because these are the gaps at least that we need to close. And one of them is we have the worst income distribution in the world. We are not the poorest region, but we have the worst income distribution. Secondly, we have a very heterogeneous production pattern. And I'm going to explain a little bit uh, later what I'm, I'm talking about. We have companies that are very close to the technological frontier, and the majority of uh, small and medium-sized companies are at the very low productivity uh, end. Now the third one is we have very low investment and savings. This is a region that has not been able to save, or to really form capital, or to invest in productive sectors. Number four is that we have a great segmentation in the labor market. We have people that earn a lot of money that are in social protection and a lot of people that are in informality, precarious jobs, people that lose their jobs and they lose everything, access to health, to education, you know, so that's the problem. And of course we have racial, ethnic, and gender discrimination, which is also historical. And uh, by far, I think our region, and particularly Central America and the Caribbean, have a very asymmetrical vulnerability to climate change. Just as a reflection, you know, we have made a calculation of the accumulated cost of natural resource disasters in Latin America, and from the 17th to today, 1972 till 2008, the accumulated cost of natural disasters has been $360 billion, of which 136 are from Central America only. So that means that that particular subregion is really vulnerable to climate change. 
Equality is about rights. It's about access to rights. Not about access to education and health and opportunities only. Because that access is only for those who have the money. We believe that in Latin America we need equality in terms of rights. Territorial cohesion, you know, this is a very pronounced, I would say, gap in the region. This inequality is really affecting productive, institutional, and social development. You know, part of the drug uh, trafficking in Mexico has to do to the lack of territorial convergence. I would say that uh, labor, and as we said, employment, is one of the most important factors in Latin America and the Caribbean. We have two decades of very poor labor market, performance, improvements, and very high rates of unemployment. But the most difficult part, I think, is informality. So, and we believe in ECLA that this, seriously, that we need a larger and stronger state that needs to be distributed, to regulate, and to supervise. We believe that we need a new equation between state, market, and society. Nobody can do it alone. The market proved to fail. The states alone will not make it unless there is a poor citizen, a, a, a real strong citizenship created behind. And that is a society that is really there. We need a long-term vision. We believe that in Latin America, there has been a lot of concentration on the next election instead of the next generation. And we think that there has to be a long-term politics. This is our message. This is what we are aiming at. This is where ECLAC is. We think that there is light at the end of the tunnel. That light is development. And development is about us. And it has to come bottom up. But nobody's going to care about our development except if we do it ourselves. Thank you very much. So it's a great honor now to invite uh, uh, Andrea Cornea and, and Martin Sandu to come to the table to uh, give some, some comments. Well, in a point, it's become again a major political issue, which of course means for people like me. I mean, I've been writing all my life about social justice. And then I think this is, again, a political topic. Before, the know, was efficiency, love and curve, and all these type of things, you know? The, the first one, and particularly reading the report, is that uh, perhaps it might be useful to consider the cost, I mean, not the cost, but the problems of the European welfare state system. And, uh, so that is there's a, there's a major result, but it has a large number of problems. Then the question is, that, uh, is it, uh, <clears throat> if you look historically at the development of Europe, can, can one say that Latin America had a similar development? Well, no, because in Latin America you had the blood de latifundia. You know, the Spaniards, they created social institutions which have been highly inequalizing. So the two themes I would like to just share some thoughts on are on the macroeconomics of the crisis uh, and inequality. And you might think that the first is a European topic and the second is a Latin American topic. I think they are a bit more related than that, but uh, you might see why it, why it looks like that at first sight, because Latin America didn't have a financial crisis. I don't want to minimize the impact of the crisis on Latin America, but that was all through trade. It was all because of the collapse in world trade. There was not a financial crisis in the way that the US and uh, Europe experienced. Uh, and why was that? Uh, well, it was because in this case, the rich countries inflicted on themselves uh, the kind of crisis that they've inflicted on developing countries for the last three decades or so. Um, and so Latin America has had the uh, sort of dubious benefit of learning from its mistakes. Uh, they obviously had a big financial crisis in 1982, the tequila crisis to a lesser degree, and, and a wave of uh, sovereign defaults or sovereign debt crisis, which would say not all defaults uh, about 10 years ago. Now, there's an obvious role for the state there. I don't think it's, uh, the conclusion is you need a larger state. I think you need a, a stronger state, perhaps, or a smarter state. But you need state policies to make sure that investments flow uh, to the users that will actually produce growth. Mm -hmm.